Okay. Welcome. Um, we are uh, trying to understand today, have a conversation with experts with different views, but who are working really hard either in human rights or in XR, VR for many years. We have people who have been working more than 10 or 20 years, so a little more on this area, either in human rights or either on the XR world. world. And we want to create a safer space where we can go more deeper and try to understand where we agree and where we disagree and try to uh, get more nuance in the discussions for better understanding of the technology. Uh, and no, we are here today just to talk and uh, I hope we can go for drinks afterwards, <laughs> but I mean, that will be harder as part of the missing piece of the metaverse, um, but I hope we can have a fun experience you know it's an experiment doing it here and i'm very happy to do it together with all of you so uh let's start uh please christina uh christina uh, it's very informal please introduce yourself when you are speaking uh, and then uh, the first panel will be christina kurt of sahel um, and brit angela thank you would you also, Katica, like to have opening remarks at the same time? Or some things to uh, say, yeah? No, no. Or just introduction? No, no, you, it's informal. You introduce yourself and speak. Yeah, that's what we are okay. doing because we are tight on the, on the schedule. Please go ahead. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Christina Podnar. I'm saying welcome because I'm here on behalf of uh, XR Safety Initiative and the entire team. And so just wanted to say, um, I'm glad to be with you today to celebrate International Human Rights Day. Um, like I said, on behalf of the entire XR Safety Initiative team, I want to extend my thanks to EFF and to Access Now for organizing this event as part of XR Safety Week. A warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming together to share your perspectives today. As partners, you know, we just want to ensure that human rights are built into the metaverse built into the immersive technology reality that's coming and that every citizen understands its choice. And so it's really important to have everybody's perspective. And we're very delighted that everybody's here today. Um, you know, this week we've been celebrating XR safety. As many of you know, we started on Monday. Uh, we've been discussing the impact of all of the real and virtual combined environments and human machine interactions and what it means to build the future of XR and this thing we call the metaverse in a way that has integrity and it also aligns with the rights that each and every person ought to have. Today, of course, is dedicated to human rights. Um, and I've been listening and observing today, both in this virtual environment and also in our analog environment. And I'm humbled to hear the stories of how over the past 73 years, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has really helped to profoundly shape our world and establish the equality and the dignity of every human being but I'm also horrified at the same time and worried, mostly because I work in the digital industry and I work with organizations that sometimes struggle to really understand what it means to embed the most basics of concepts into digital, let alone something more sort of loft, if you will. In an environment where some companies still have you know, policies requiring employees to bring a doctor's note when they've been out sick, I often wonder how we've given so little thought to policies guiding our online activities. I'm hoping we can discuss that today and also really just sort of get into a mindset that we haven't been in the last 30 years, right? Until now in the web space, at least, nobody really wanted to be left behind. So we all took a do the best we can now and figure it out later kind of approach. I didn't know that later would be 30 years away from now. We don't want it to be another 30 years where we find ourselves in a conundrum that I can't work our way outside of. So my background, just so you know, is really working with uh, Global 2000 organizations. I also work with nonprofits. Um, I find that most businesses either, you know, have very few policies or none at all. Um, you know, but still digital activities being carried out in minimal consideration of legal regulatory uh, requirements. 
or even, you know, consideration for, for the end user. So the lack of privacy and definitely accessibility that I keep running across, um, inclusivity and safety within digital tools today is by design. It's a prime example of what happens when we move fast and break things to do things, thinking we can come back, like I said, and fix them at a later date. So I don't think we have the time to redo it this time around. Metaverse and immersive reality is too important. The risks are too high. And I think we need to actually start this process today. And that's really what the XR Safety Week has been all about. It's what we've been saying from an XR SI perspective. Really, if we take a look, time to stop winging it. Because whereas historically we've had issues that result in minor gaffes, perhaps it's a social media faux pas, or not a really great performing um, mobile application, those are inconsequential when we compare them to the risks of the metaverse. And when we think about things like maybe, you know, having somebody set their couch on fire because they don't realize that unlike the immersive world or, or their extended reality space, your couch isn't going to regenerate itself in your living room in real life. It just doesn't happen that way. So, in addition to really kind of considering everything that we've been um, happening in the last 30 years, I hope that today we can actually come together on this monumental day, uh, make sure that we really have best intentions in front of us, but mm. also learn from our past mistakes, right? And I'm here certainly to listen and learn because my expertise is in digital. And I hope that you, know, you can kind of help me understand and we can maybe discuss and brainstorm ways that digital can be done safely, can actually be created without breaking things, but foremost that it can be created with kind of some fundamentals in mind, things like privacy and anonymity and safety and inclusivity. And so this morning um, or earlier today for those um, in the east of the United States or in other parts of the world, we actually had a nice round table where we just started to discuss safety frameworks and the type of data that might be collected via XR capabilities, whether you're in an educational environment, in a work environment, or a medical XR environment. And so I'm hopeful based on our discussion that we're coming together to understand a better, more productive data set that can ensure not just safety from a technical perspective, but also ensure human rights. And so as individuals today, I would really challenge us to come together you know, really think through all of the opportunities that we have, but really leave the space feeling very hopeful that even though the metaverse is about, um, you know, various technologies, all of which have a lot of risks, um, that we can actually create a framework in which there can be safety, which means opportunity for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. We now have Vitan Heller, which is international human rights lawyer and consul at Folly Hoke LLP. Thank you, Vitan. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Access Now, um, XRSI, and um, and EFF for gathering us all together here today. I think we're going to have a good time and at minimum, we're all going to figure out how to use alt space better together. So that's a good thing. Uh, like Kat said, I'm an international human rights lawyer. Um, I started off working on international criminal law issues and how technology intersected with that. So I used to prosecute genocide and war crimes. Um, and eventually, through a, a long series of events, um, I ended up focusing exclusively on new technologies and the impact that they have on society. So if you, uh, if you, if you ask me what my legal practice is, I, uh, I'll kind of joke with you and tell you that I'm the, I'm the lawyer in the black mirror. So I've been focusing on the misfit of law with XR for about four years now. There's a couple of things that I wanted to point out to sort of foreground our discussion and, um, and, and make it so that we can all be thinking about these problems in the same way. Do you remember one thing that I say today? The one thing that I, I'd like you all to remember is to start with the hardware. And this is coming from somebody who lives and breathes human rights. You wanna start with the hardware. All of the mismatches that I see between current laws, between social expectations, between um, 
user expectations, a lot of these misunderstandings come from the the fact that people don't understand what this technology is and why it's fundamentally different than um, than social media, than um, why why spatial computing is special. So uh, there's a there's a couple things that I'd like to point out as examples of this. Number one, um, when you look at biometrics law, everybody assumes that biometrics law is going to be something that hopefully will will help in this realm. But at least in the American context, biometrics law is, um, um, if, if, you'll, if you'll pardon me, it's, it's a shit show when you try to apply it to XR. Um, biometrics law is centered around the concept of identity. It's designed to protect who you are individually based off of these unique identifiers that come from your body, like your, like, like your fingerprint or, or your, um, your retina scan. When you look at the way that VR and AR technology works, this is different. This is more like the early days of the internet where you had to log in and have a verifiable billing address. The companies know who you are. That identity is not the issue. It's, it's more questions related to what the sensors can get from you. So concepts of mental privacy rather than identity. That's a little bit abstract, but, um, but, but I hope it makes sense. Uh, two, the concept of privacy needs to be rejiggered for spatial computing. When you look at the way that privacy um, is accounted for and regulated in sort of the social media web two context, it doesn't transfer over to the way that the sensors that um, head-mounted devices have work today. There's a lot of information you can pick up from a head-mounted device that you just could never really get from the internet. And the compilation of unanticipated data sets is what results in human rights harms and privacy violations. One of the things that, that I get on my high horse about is the possibility of um, biometric information being combined with targeted advertising. And I call this biometric psychography because it's, it's basically the closest thing to reading your mind. The information that the sensors pick up, like uh, pupil tracking or uh, potentially um, sort of electrical pulses in your wrist or your skin moistness can be used to determine things about you that you may not consent to give away when you're in alt space or when you're playing a game. Uh, they can, they have been shown to indicate whether or not somebody is telling the truth or whether or not somebody is sexually attracted to someone else or whether or not someone shows preclinical signs of illnesses like ADHD, schizophrenia, or autism. These are the type of private things that people may not even know about themselves. So how can they meaningfully consent to give that information away to a company? This is why mental privacy is a whole new manifestation of what privacy law um, is and, and should be. When, when I started doing this work, um, Tom Furness, who is the inventor of one of the first headsets, asked me why I'd want to put a polygraph with six cameras on my face. So I think about that a lot. Um, the other thing that I, that I think about is the way that fundamental human rights precepts like equality manifest when you're in, when you're in a headset. I always think about um, the fact that when you're in an immersive world, you, because of the concept of presence, you feel like you're really there. And your brain processes what happens to you in the same way it processes memories. So it's if somebody harasses you or says horrible things, it's not like a social media feed where you're scrolling down and it, and it hurts, but it doesn't feel like that person is sitting right next to you and getting in your face. And that's what it feels like in VR, and that's why it's different. So when you look at content moderation schemes, for social media like Twitter and Facebook, they don't cleanly transfer. Oh, that guy hit my chair. Um, they just don't. They don't cleanly transfer over 
to um, to spatial computing environments. You need to create separate terms of service based on neuroscience and how our brains interpret actions in this new medium. And most companies aren't there yet. Um, I also like to, um, and, and hopefully um, Jessica will talk about this a little later, I like to think about different populations that are using this technology and the assumptions that we bring to the table when we think about first adopters or different uses related to um, disabled populations or minority populations or female populations. I, I think about the fact that you cannot give, um, you cannot provide childcare while you are in an immersive environment unless there's pass through. And so I think that is actually going to limit the number of female researchers and participants in this space. And so I really, uh, that's part of the things that I point out to companies and sometimes they go, oh, I, I never thought about that. I would like them not just to think about that, I would like them to do something about that. I now, my time is up, so I, I hope this has been more than a fruit salad of concepts at you, and I look forward to engaging you in conversation. Thank you all. Thank you, Frita. Appreciate it. Clap, clap. <laughs> uh, now we have uh, Kurt of Sahal, the Beauty Executive Director and General Council of ESA. Kurt, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us to celebrate International Human Rights Day. Uh, thank you, uh, Katisa, for the, the introduction. Uh, in addition to uh, my work on the, the executive team and general counsel at EFF, uh, I have been part of the EFF team that's been thinking about XR issues, trying to protect and preserve the rights we hold dear moving forward. And so it's a real honor to be here with all of the, the, the experts, everyone who's come, uh, so that uh, we can think through these issues and try to make that brighter future. One of the topics we've been examining is government surveillance in XR. Right now, with a panoply of devices of the modern age, things like phones, tablets, laptops, and more, more and more common items becoming smart, getting connected to the internet, we are already facing a golden age of surveillance. And these part items are part of your daily lives. But XR holds the potential to take that to the next level. Dell developers have envisioned VR environments that could provide a photorealistic model of your home, so you can invite VR users over to what looks like your living room. It's a wonderful prospect, especially in a time of a pandemic, to keep in touch with distant friends who can now teleport right into an environment that reflects your life. But unlike your real life living room, all the details of your private space are now digitized, transferred to the other person over the wire. Without strong protection, each of those bits can be intercepted or stored for later analysis. With sufficient detail, this contains a record of the books on your shelves, the papers on your coffee table, the art on your walls. A search that mimics the police in your home, even uh, without the necessary notice that comes from police officers knocking on your door. We must ensure a future where government still needs a warrant to look into your virtual home, regardless of where the data is actually stored. AR poses another set of dangers, as AR will become part of the interactions as you walk down the public street. And many visions of AR include tools to get visual, audio, and spatial mapping of everything around you. If this becomes popularized, you can imagine a public event, perhaps a political rally or a protest, where dozens or maybe hundreds of AR glasses are there in the crowd. And if that data is stored, it creates a time machine. The authorities could take all that data and put themselves in the crowd, looking around at who is there. With enough AR camera angles, a virtual time traveler from the government can walk around, listen to conversations, collect evidence on the AR viewers and all the bystanders who never agreed to be part of this kind of future. And XR technologies can do much more. As we just heard about some of the biometrics things, they are gathering deeply personal biometric information. And this can be very helpful in animating avatars and bringing nuance and expression to a virtual conversation. It can also be used to speculate on the state of your mind. Now, of course, that technology is not very uh, ready. There's a lot of snake oil there, but uh, it may work. But if worrisome either way, if it does learn about your inner feelings, it's a huge invasion of privacy that can force you to essentially testify against yourself, against your will. And if it gets the analysis wrong, then the government may make unwarranted assumptions about you, bringing uh, the dystopian policing practices we were warned of in the Minority Pro Report ever closer. 
Human rights remain vital, whether you're in a virtual world or augmenting your real life. We need to be able to take advantage of the promise of, VR, of XR without sacrificing these fundamental rights against intrusive surveillance. Now, one possible future now prominent in conversation is a version of the metaverse. I don't think there's any definitive understanding of the term. Perhaps we can talk about that more later. As you, many of you know, the term originates from the Neil Stevenson's 1992 novel, Snow Crash, which imagined a single worldwide VR environment with its virtual real estate controlled by a powerful single entity, the Global Multimedia Protocol Group. The novel's metaphors was envisioned as a heavily gated a community institutionalizing inequity with the disenfranchised having low resolution avatars and subjected to social stigma. This is not the metaverse that we want to see, and it doesn't need to be. We can build upon that interesting ideas that have come before us from, uh, from novels and from uh, early applications of the metaverse and discard the dystopias. There does not need to be a single metaverse, nor does any metaverse need to be owned or controlled by a single entity. Indeed, one way of the th thing of the metaverse is a generic term for the space in which a vast array of different decentralized and interoperable VR and AR services exist and interact. This is a bit of the topic for our second session, a community lab on interoperability, decentralization, user rights, and XR technology. We'll explore how XR can be built in an open and decentralized way to ensure platform control is not leveraged by state or private actors. Decentralization was a key feature of the early internet, a network of networks which has been continually centralized over the last few decades. We've seen the problems with single points of controls or single points of failure. A walled garden, garden that zealously enforces its envisioned environment may be attractive to some, but it's best to have a choice and maybe be able to move freely between environments that you want to visit. We don't want to be locked out or locked in. We can instead imagine a world of world like the internet's network of networks that allows anyone at any point to interact effectively and with their user rights intact, interoperability will be key. For example, allowing you to keep a consistent avatar across platforms for each way you want to present, which is subject to your own control and not tied to a single provider. Interoperability enables competition so users can effectively decide what environment works best for them. XR technologies may be new and not widely used right now, but the technologies of today are setting the stage for tomorrow. So join the discussion in our community lab and our round table coming up to help chart the course for a future where technology will be enhancing our lives and preserving our human rights. And with that, please allow me to pass the mic to the facilitators of our first round table on privacy advertising, biometrics and government surveillance, Katitsa and Daniel. Thank you, Kurt. Today, my name is Katitza Rodriguez. I'm the Policy Director for Global Privacy at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And here is my colleague, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Introduce yourself. Um, I'm Daniel Luper. I'm a Policy Analyst for Access Now. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just clicked on something that I shouldn't have clicked. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, great. Um, I know just to say, um, yeah, really looking forward to this session and also to mention that uh, today, in honor of International Human Rights Day, Access Now, along with EFF, published a statement to um, call for the protection and extension of human rights uh, in XR technologies, which uh, I hope you all get a chance to check out. Um, so, for the to start off the discussion, I'll pass back to Katitza, who's going to introduce the first uh, topic. Thank you. Uh, well, today we are going to talk about the metaverse. Kurt was mentioned that there should not be a single metaverse, but nor does any metaverse need to be owned or controlled by a single entity. So, I would like to call uh, Camille, Avi, Andrea, and maybe Fabian to define what vision of the metaverse. You can just uh, react in informal way. Whoever wants to go first, Camille, Avi, Andrea, or Fabian. Do you hear me? I'm lost. Uh, I don't see anybody. I'm over here. Okay, let's go forward. Where are, you? Where are you? You're not getting 
good. Yeah, I heard I heard Andrea's voice. Okay, I'm back. Do you hear me? Is Andrea here? I think over here. Andrea, you have to come to the stage to be able to speak. So maybe, Avi, can you tell us your vision of the metaverse to start while others start lining up? Um, sure, I'll go first. Uh, <clears throat> I think one thing is that I'll agree with uh, Tony Parisi has put out a, a really great set of 10 points of what we want the metaverse to be. And I think one of those points is that ultimately there should only be one metaverse in the sense that there's only one internet. Um, but I think everybody realizes that that's not the short term. In the short term, everybody's trying out their own ideas. Each of these worlds that we might visit are separate and um, very different in the way they operate. And there's a lot of people that are working hard right now on interoperability and trying to figure out what that might be um, and trying to understand what the rules need to be, what needs to be shared. I, I think of the metaverse as it comes together as being just it's the future of the internet. It's the future of how do we share things? Um, hang on, hang on one second. Just... So um, that uh, we can be thinking about how to share things across different uh, domains, you know, we'll call them for now. A safer term to use, I think, would be virtual worlds, to think about alt space as being a virtual world. Um, and uh, a variety of other virtual worlds. None of them are truly metaverses yet, but as they come together in the same way that the web came together as a series of documents that wound up being cross-linked to each other, the metaverse will evolve, I think, as, as ultimately this set of, of virtual worlds that are cross-linked and connected to each other. And openness is one of those really important criteria we talk about. It should, it should be open in the sense that we have a set of standards that we can follow. If anybody can connect. They don't need permission. They just need to follow the protocols and they can connect and that will allow for a great diversity of ideas. But I think at the same time, we need to think about safety. And while we can work really hard on making everything open, the safety are the limitations, the, the rules that prevent people from, for example, collecting your personal data uh, without telling you. And so, uh, you know, some people will argue for openness and I think that's a great thing and interoperability and that's a great thing. But we have to, I think, spend our time here thinking about how do we bake in even before some of these things exist, how do we bake in rules that will prevent business model from, from cropping up or extending into, into the metaverse that are exploitive in the same way that many have been exploitive today? And, and the companies that want those business models aren't going to come out and say, we want to exploit you. They're just going to say, we want openness. They're going to come and say, they're going to say all the right things. Uh, we want interoperability, but we want openness. But what they're going to do behind the scenes is fight any rule which will prevent their business model from uh, from making money in that new system. In the same way that we saw Do Not Track, I mean, you know, uh, how much effort did uh, Facebook put into trying to prevent Do Not Track behind the scenes? It's, it's really, it's really incredible if you, if you, you know, hear the full story about how far they went uh, trying to prevent that. So right now we're trying to say, what are the things that are possible? What's likely to happen? And how can we set up rules uh, in order to uh, make these things uh, safe? And I'll stop there. I can go quickly next. You guys hear me? Hi. Yeah, I want to say that, uh, wait, I want to give a little bit the rules. Uh, please, any answer, because we have a lot of questions. It's just three minutes to two minutes, a short answer. And then um, we have more or less for each, for this session, like eight more minutes. So if Micaela can talk and then if someone else wants to react, that will be great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I don't want to go over Andrea because she wanted to say something. And I could speak in the next session if she wants to go. Oh, I I was just going to go, going to give my definition of what the metaverse is for me. But um, I can definitely get that after, after you, or should I just go for it? Please go for it. Uh, both can go. <laughs> so Juan <laughs> right. Andrea and then Micaela. <laughs> All right, so just really quickly, um, I, I want to say, I think metaverse is the place that allows us to explore
or what VR has to offer together. But I have to then say another sentence about what I think VR has to offer. So I belong to a school of thought that believes that we do fix identities, that we, um, we always have the ability to explore many, many sides of ourselves. We live in a world in which um, there are many, many, many interests. Some come from culture, political and social interests that push this idea that we have a unitary identity, that the purpose of our lives is to find out who we really, really are. Um, I think the most interesting approach, however, is to say that, well, maybe we're many things and many identities. And technologies like gaming and now VR allows us to really pursue that and really find out a little bit more about that. So that's the personal level of what VR is for me. Um, and the metaverse should be a place where we do that collectively. Thank you. Mike Mikaela? Uh, this is a really interesting conversation because everyone he's here has an original take of what the metaverse is. And if we go around, probably anyone can add something different to the mix. One thing that for me is important is I came from a video game uh, policy background, and I'm also uh, have been working for a long time in artificial intelligence ethics. So one of the things that I want to raise the point is that we are not dealing with something that is fundamentally new in some aspects. Because if we are trying to start the discussions about VR, XR, and the metaverse from a new, to risk losing our history about internet governance and, and whatever we have been researching and talking for years about artificial intelligence ethics. For me, immersive reality is a problem of magnitude because we are dealing with the same problems, but now in a more immer immersive environment that force us to augment what we think about human rights. So uh, when we are talking about advertisement and mental privacy, this is something that we have been talking about artificial intelligence and the inferences that we have that, that companies can construct about us for years now. But the thing is that it's getting closer to, to us. And maybe as someone in the table was, was talking, one of the fundamental differences is that uh, I, I'm from the first years of the, of the internet when this, the talk go, went like, uh, nobody knows that you are a dog. Nowadays, we know that you are a dog and the race and the, and the food that you eat and everything about you. And the thing about the metaverse is that um, a lot of this data that is going to be captured about you is going to be involuntary. Something that you cannot avoid, something that you cannot escape from. And also raise the point about accessibility. Because when we talk about uh, how do we access, and I said this on Monday, but you're talking that we have a third of our world population that doesn't have a connection to the internet, has never have connected to the internet. So if we start defining the concept of the metaverse without taking these people into account, the risk uh, building a very uh, privileged view of what this metaverse should be. And as Avi and, and Katitza were saying, also is that we are talking about the metaverse, but in reality we have metaverses and virtual worlds. It's like Thank you, Michaela. Uh, I would like to call Fabian. Maybe you want to jump in and share your vision of the metaverse? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. I... Okay. Okay. Sorry about this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, to, to me, it's really funny to hear the word being so famous because well, the first time I started to actually work on it was five years ago, actually, in 2016, uh, for the first WCC workshop. And I went there for interoperability so that different, um, different worlds could be connected together. So to me, that's the core aspect of the metaverse is let's say we finish this conversation here today uh, and then we can bring that conversation or some artifacts of it or recording and keep on going through the conversation being 
to avatars or screenshots or voice or whatever. Uh, and it's not a bubble and yet another bubble. Not everything has to be isolated too. So to me, that is the core aspect. Uh, and But it's not just a technical aspect. Of course, we mentioned interoperability before uh, and standards also. That's why the, the WFC was important. But I think it's also just to point there, for example, the, the star sponsor of, of the uh, conference of, of the discussion, uh, if there is interoperability, but there is a monopoly, an economical power that dominates everything else, there, will, there is no metaverse in practice, even though it's technically easy to interoperability. So that's kind of my worry, let's say, at the moment, that a uh, couple of years ago, I, I would not believe this would happen, and I wouldn't believe I would have such a good headset for such a cheap price. But now I'm Worry of stepping back in terms of the uh, just basically the, the economical foundation we have in order to build that metaverse. That I'm confident we get um, the ability to make it, but I'm worried the foundations, the economical foundations, economical monopolies, make it just unrealistic. Sean or Ivan, would you like to share your vision of a metaverse? We just have the last. Question before passing to the next uh, the next question, would you like to react, Ivan or Sean? I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you, I can't tell. Yes. yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Yeah, I I think I just want to add something based on my experience so far of this event. Right. If this event is giving us a little bit of a, a sneak peek into that. It's it's pretty disorienting and unusual. I mean, obviously, our our sort of normal uh, design is 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 not applicable here. And so, one of the things the metaverse I think fundamentally offers is, if we're going to be engaged in VR like this, our standard habits, our standard expectations for for how we move around, for how we interact, all of this feels upended even just basic boundary management of walking onto the stage felt odd. So for me, when I think about whatever the metaverse might be, I think fundamentally about gaps between how I'm normally able to engage in the world, think about where uh, where threats are coming from, think about where affordances are coming from, and the possibility of being put in environments like this that just seem so uh, fantastical and Disney-like, it, it's very hard to imagine anything bad happening here and I, I think that's potentially a little bit troubling. Sean? Oh, great. I can, yeah, okay. Hi. Um, what I do is I, I'm more of a creator. I do 3D computer graphics and interactive VR experiences. And um, I, I think in terms of some of the, like the headset that I'm wearing actually has eye tracking built in, and that's one of the... It's one of the things that, oh, okay. It's one of the things that I, I'm interested in investigating in terms of how much data will be transferred and how much can it communicate? Because I, mean, I think that everybody's talking about the future. And of course, um, the idea is that we're gonna be looking for how fast the algorithms are going to be actually giving us effective information. Because right now, um, you know, I have a friend whose specialty is eye tracking, and he he was sort of laughing at me right now because he was like, you know, how much data that's putting out? It's not it's not telling you anything super meaningful unless you're really digging for it. And so the idea is that I'm using this as a uh, as an input interface, but I'm also here. Um, I'm very interested in making sure that the ethics get applied as the data gets uh, figured out and and the algorithms. Um, I think to jump on to the, the next question, there's lots of fascinating stuff that we've heard from everyone there that I'm sure we'll come back to a bit. Um, I wanted to circle back a bit to the topic that Kurt already raised at the beginning about government surveillance, because I think there were some fascinating observations there that you know you might not initially think of about um, you know, being able to, governments being able to access your sort of virtual versions of your house uh, documents, all sorts of things that you might have um, in VR, but I think there's a lot of other ways in which um, government surveillance uh, can be 
exacerbated, um, you know, new forms which can emerge uh, in VR and AR. Um, so I wanted to um, turn to Dave and to ask, because I know you've been doing some work, um, a lot of work uh, on how law enforcement is using technologies, and maybe you could give us some insights into the type of stuff that you've seen there. Sure. Um, so my name is, is Dave, and I am Director of Investigations at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I focus on the intersection of technology and the criminal justice system. And one thing I've noticed um, over the last few years is the adoption of AR, VR, and XR technology by law enforcement in the United States. Um, so let me talk for a second about VR and how law enforcement is using VR and why this is a human rights concern. So there are several vendors out there who sell virtual reality simulations and virtual reality trainings to law enforcement agencies. Um, and a lot of these companies that are selling it are companies that have been selling questionable technology to law enforcement for quite some time. So for example, one of the top vendors is Axon. Axon, the taser, from taser because it became so poisonous. But now taser makes body worn cameras, they make drones, they make facial recognition, and now they make VR. And they are selling VR to law enforcement, saying this is gonna help you with, you know, be better with use of force and be more empathetic. We don't know that that's the case. There are several other vendors. There's another vendor called Wrap that makes this gun that shoots these Ola things that will tie up suspects. They're selling VR now. And uh, in California, the uh, commission that handles p police training has now dispatched, so as of 2021, 70 virtual reality systems across the state of California to help train people on um, uh, you know, use of force and racially biased policing and that sort of thing, which could have a positive outcome. However, we don't know, and we don't actually get to see this this technology, which in California is actually questionable about whether that's even legal. Because in California, we have a law that all training materials that police use are supposed to be available on the internet. But to this day, I've never seen any of these to reality police trainings placed on the internet, and I'm not even sure how that would work. And so that's another human rights concern, is transparency around these issues. If governments create a virtual reality experience, how do we use the Freedom of Information Act to get a copy of that? Like, what does that take? You know, we see data sets getting printed out and scanned in. Can you print out a virtual reality experience? It's hard to wrap your mind around it. Um, but I also think we have to look what's going to be happening in, in when virtual reality and augmented reality are deployed into the field and how that changes relationships and changes policing. So already things that we've been seeing with um, these devices actually deployed in the field, um, Oculus Go's had been converted into field sobriety tests. So they would be used instead of the, you know, the, watch your, I'm going to try to do this with my fan, but the used to be like, watch my <laughs> finger. And then now there's a new technology to put on a headset and it would do the same sort of treatment. Um, there are these um, 360 degree camera balls that a SWAT team could throw into a say hostage situation or a place they're about to raid while a cop sits outside with a VR headset watching in 360 degrees as the SWAT raid. On. But the things that we really need to keep an eye out are when police start adopting augmented reality more. When there are issues, when a headset can do live face recognition, when a headset can give police officers heat recognition, when it can show you where, you know, the map in other rooms, um, when a cop's headset can uh, reveal somebody's identity before they've even walked into the situation. And we've certainly seen with cops' mobile phones how that is transformed policing, where a police officer's phone can do face recognition, where a police officer can type in your name and get, you know, your, your vehicle records or find out where you've been driving around a neighborhood. And just imagine when that phone moves to a cop's face and how that um, impacts what could be deadly encounters. So I would say as we're talking about this human, you know, human rights and VR and XR, it can't just be us talking about the consumer, you know, average member of the public using a VR headset and what kind of data is collected from them and what police can get from them and what can advertisers use. But when VR is being integrated in various professions that have a human rights implication, whether that's enforcement or the military, um, or even when VR evidence is introduced into a courtroom, 
you really have to take those into, into consideration, start thinking about building the future we want with that technology. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We have time for one or two reactions. Is there any reaction to the comments? Or we pass to the next question. I think an interesting question to go along with what Dave just said is um, not just looking at the potential for abuse of authority, but how citizens should enforce the full panoply of constitutional rights that they have. And um, by that, I mean, um, I'm, I'm a former prosecutor. And so we once made a like, virtual world reconstructive reconstruction of a scene and found that it contained, um, it, it, it basically sh contained exculpatory information. So it showed that um, the person who, one of the people who had been accused could not have done it. So I'm, I'm interested in also looking at how like fourth, fifth and sixth amendment concerns integrate with the type of content that we have here. Um, in addition to the potential for um, abuse of authority. I also think it's kind of worth pointing out too that even though there is risk that comes with this type of technology and certainly there's opportunities for abuse, I think we've actually seen from studies as well that police officers who are both wearing body cameras as well as actually have um, virtual reality or immersive technology available to accompany that uh, makes police officers more aware and more just in terms of how they're applying laws. And so I think that, you know, there's opportunities and risks and we really need to be able to talk about them as a holistic concept, not to say that it's always good or always bad, but really let that down to individual pieces of data and the context in which that data can be used. Because in some instances, we're seeing that it can actually be used for good and in some it can be used for bad. I think that the risk here is that not being deliberate and netting it down to the data level to understand the context through which the data travels and thus be able to understand where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate. Great, right. thanks um, for those reactions. Shall we move on to the, the next thing that we wanted to talk about, I think, or sort of do a quick run through of like major threats to privacy and data protection um, in XR. Um, and yeah, we have a couple of prompt questions to throw to some of the experts. Um, I think the, the first one is for Sean that, um, you know, you've been doing a lot of work on the type of algorithms that are being developed for the interpretation of different types of XR data. Um, so could you tell us a bit about where that headed and how you think that matters for people's rights? Uh, thanks so much. Can you repeat the question? It was a little hard. Yeah, sorry. Um, Katitza, did you want to rephrase that maybe? Yeah. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, Sean, uh, we were talking about that you work a lot about the convergence of technology, keeping an eye on the algorithms that are being developed for interpretation of all these kind of data. We were discussing that sometimes, and Kurt mentioned earlier in his speech, that some of this data right now is a snake oil. Uh, maybe not really, you know, read your mind or your emotions and predict them. Uh, but you work on AI and you do a lot of research and uh, with a lot of people working on this area. What are your thoughts about it? Well, that's, I think you sort of are hitting the nail on the head that at the moment it's, it, it's very murky, it's murky at best in terms of the data that's coming through. I think that, you know, certainly as XR inputs increase, so, um, Things like uh, people mentioned, you know, the, the different type of biometric sensors, so or um, you know, eye tracking, or you know, the other things like, I mean, we don't have very, very few, except for like extremely high-end research level equipment, um, doesn't really sort of output data. But I mean, there's certainly all the pieces are out there, and I think that we're going to start taking more and more pieces like right now like our avatars are hands and torsos right with a head attached but i mean they don't they, it supposedly you know the research says that you know 90 with a 90 something percent accuracy once we have sensors on our feet it'll be able to identify who we are or you know other other things like there's a lot of uh, sort of 
eye scanning technology. But um, at the moment, the the data is very it's very separated. So, but I mean, I'm so glad that I'm I'm here because it's great that everybody's thinking ahead of the time, uh, ahead of ahead in order to, um, because there's so much data being generated. Did I just react to that? Because I just massive plus one on everything that you just said, and I you know. We've used the term snake oil, but I would just go as far as to say that a lot of the type of, uh, you know, algorithm systems that are out there interpreting some of this data are total bullshit. Um, and there is an assumption that with more and more data, they'll get better, that the inferences will necessarily get better as the data gets deeper, and that is not the case. And there are certain, you know, questions with machine learning that will improve, that can improve on a sort of a a near linear trajectory to quite a high level of accuracy if they've got enough data. There are other questions that are from the start based on crappy theories um, that will not get better. You know, if you're trying to predict criminality from someone's facial structure, the problem there is at the level of the question itself. Um, and so we do need to, I think, have this separation to not oversell what these companies can do in when we're highlighting threats. And we need to, you know, Identify the different threats accurately and not oversell this idea that we can be manipulated or minds can be read. There will be certain things that can be done, but there are other ones where we need to attack these things on the level, the very questions, the very things that these systems are claiming that they can do. Thank you. Anyone wants to add to this comment or we pass? Next question. Uh, raise your hand if you can, or make me a signal. <laughs> uh, See some okay, you. good. Fabian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if we can quickly just to bounce back a little bit on, on what Daniel was saying, because it was something I uh, experienced pretty much on a daily basis, um, meaning that you have a lot of paperwork from big tech minimizing really anything and everything. The problem is, it's a local startup. People start to dig and maybe question, want to see how it's done. And it's, say, Facebook or Microsoft or Google. Uh, they just assume that if it's not ready yet, it's going to yeah. be there one month, in three months, in six months, there is R&D behind it and whatever. And the problem is that it translates to powers. It translates to uh, either current contract with startups not happening or uh, just investment. Uh, not happening, uh, VC money not being invested. Again, it goes back to uh, being careful with monopolies. If you don't want to have one uh, implementation of the metaverse that is not respected or the values they want, so I think it's really, really strategical, let's say, uh, to 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 snake all those fake promises. Be very careful to buy it because it's being used and it. Hello. Uh -oh. Hello. Nothing. Uh, just... uh, okay. We. Okay. I have for a minute. Um, Barry, um, I have a question for you. Uh, you have just recent recently finished your PhD. Uh, you hear me, Barry? Yes. You just recently finished your PhD on on data protection and automated decision making process. I know AR XR is a new area for you, but you have been working on algorithms for a little while and human rights. Can you share with us something basic for the uh, about privacy and data protection to share with the XR community why you think data protection matters in a world where we are uh, algorithms are making constant determination of our life about us thank you thank you Katrice. can you hear me now yes yeah okay. yeah okay it's really quiet okay so hi everyone as Katrice said i'm judy joanna i i work at EFF as well i'm a associate director for latin american policy and i finished I recently finished a PhD dealing with self-dissemination and algorithm decision making. So, um, just as you know, uh, high-level high-level thoughts about it. 
I would say that the right to privacy relates different ways in which access to or knowledge of others about us affects our life. The power to inhibit our ability to self-determinate and self-define ourselves, the ability to result in restrictions on the exercise of other rights and access to opportunities, the possibility of inducing and limiting our choices or causing us, us harm. This relates to the protection of private life and secrecy, but also concerns protections and data subject powers regarding the circulation or the flow of information related to ourselves. And there is also a key consideration of the role of the right to privacy in ensuring other rights and freedoms, such as freedom of expression, access to information, health, and others. And we're here in the Human Rights Day, so we have a whole range of rights that are affected by this. So, and, and when it comes to data protection in the context of auto automated decision making and AI, for example, the processing of data intermediate people's exercise, as I said, of a range of a range of these rights from crucial freedoms to economic and social rights. So data protection is about protecting the person vis-a-vis -vis the processing of data related to this person. And it's about setting the proper protections to the appropriate flows of this information, where such information can be understood as a protection or extension of who we are in an informational and digitally mediated world. How the information related to you flows has the potential to affect you negatively and how you interact and affect you negatively and affect how you interact with society as well. So for example, to reveal health or emotional fragilities that be, can be used in decisions about you or to actions targeting you in ways that you can't predict or clearly realize as, as Beacon mentioned, but also harms that can come from algorithms when they do it right or even when they are crappy and do it wrong, depending on for what purposes these systems are being employed. And when, so it, it, as we are talking about right, uh, uh, informational self-determination, when, when this right of informational self-determination was enshrined by the German Constitutional Court in, 18, in, in 1983, the court held that who cannot more or less assess the knowledge of possible partners in communication can be substantially inhibited in her freedom to plan or decide with self-determination. A social order and a legal order that supports it in which citizens no longer know who, what, when, and on what occasion is, know about, is known about them would no longer be compatible with the right of self-determination in information. And building on this and thinking about our ability nowadays to create and develop um, inferences about persons and groups, this brings us a series of other issues and, con and concerns. Uh, because uh, when inferences are created relating to the processing of data, seeking to infer our patterns based on the patterns of those that seem similar to us according to certain specified pa parameters, this relates to a knowledge that is created about you and that can influence on whether you get a loan, a social benefit, a job, another, uh, other, another series of things. So having the appropriate protections and control over our information in this context need to take into account that the concern is not only not knowing what others know about us, but also um, the problem is not being aware about how the knowledge about ourselves is built and the potential consequences of that in our life choices and opportunities. This was the reflection that I wanted to bring. Great. Anyone want to react specifically on the... Um... Please uh, come or... to the. You have to come to the stage. Yeah. You have to be in the stage. If not, it will not allow you. Yeah, please, uh, Dylan. Hi, I'm uh, Dylan Urquidi from uh, Unity Lab, Research Division of Unity Technologies. Just wanted to say that I uh, really appreciate how you just laid that information out. And I wanted to see 
how do you feel that differential privacy and homomorphic encryption play into what it was that you described there? Thank you for your question. I'm not um, I'm, I'm, I'm a specialist um, on differential pri privacy and homophonic encryption. So um, my my take is uh, more in terms of how um, law could um, how we can regulate user control and um, protections in the appropriate of information in order to. Um, in order to be, in order to, in order to protect needs, in terms of knowledge, um, and in terms of um, principles like knowledge. I'm sorry, there is a noise. A background noise. I'm not very sure. So I think that uh, both of this, both, both of uh, the solutions. That you mentioned, they are um, relevant for uh, asserting and um, ensuring um, principles like data minimization or other principles that relate to an appropriate flow of information uh, and personal information. And this relates to a, a broader um, regulation um, on on the matter on the matter. Interesting. Appreciate that response. So, um, and I understand what you've mentioned that you're not an expert in these areas, but it, it appears as if, um, say, if we implemented something like homomorphic encryption, which allows the processing of operations on data that is never decrypted, and we combine that with differential privacy to be able to train our models to say that something that Andrew Pratt and the Open Mind organization, along with the PySIS library that they've created, would allow for us to number one, uh, eliminate bias from trained models, but then number two, be able to make sure that any computation that is being performed on that encrypted data does not need to be decrypted anywhere in and out uh, or up or down the stream there. So it, it seems like it could potentially eliminate, you know, a man in the middle type sniffing or uh, a conglomerate owning the mass of that unencrypted data for whatever rationale that they might have so that they, they can serve you the answer to your question, but they don't know the root of that data, so they can't train that predictive model that they would be able to operate when you use it. So I'll, I'll end my, uh, my mini rant right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darlan. That sounds like exciting and interesting. We would like to follow up with you to dig more onto, onto this. Um, I, we have a last question, maybe for, not last, but the next question for Ivan. Uh, you have been thinking about major threats to privacy, um, uh, you have your your vision of the metaverse. Can you share your your thoughts of what are the major threats to privacy in the XR world, Ivan? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I don't know. Where... One, uh, and it's become very apparent to me just participating in this event. Um, if we think about the importance of transparency, and again, with the rules of the game being so different in virtual reality than in anything else that we have. Um, sort of experiential grounding in. It's one thing to think about what disclosure to regulators needs to include, but from the perspective of visceral notice, it seems very clear to me that just as there needs to be some sort of onboarding that enables people to figure out sort of basic, you know, movements, basic controls, I would say there needs to be a kind of ethical onboarding into whatever the, the, the metaverse turns out to be so that one's introduction isn't just about moving back and forth, but you know, again, if I was being hypothetical and grounding it in this this experience here, if this was my first time interacting here, it would be great if I had a training module that at the end of moving around gave me some feedback on forms of tracking that I wasn't expecting. It might tell me that in the first two minutes, my head went here and there. These were my focal points. Uh, these might be the kinds of inferences that could be made. So I guess what I'm saying from a first round is, you know, transparency is thought of in many ways. But if we have, yet again, another kind of legalese version of uh, terms of service contracts where people are overloaded, these things can't be cognitively processed in usable ways, I would want to actually use the specific environment to be able to make this information more salient. I jump in quickly just in response to that because I think that's a, a really great idea. And there's, there's been a couple of projects that are sort of similar to that around emotion recognition. And Noah Levinson had a project called Stealing Your Feelings. And then I forget the name of, there was another, I think it was a Dutch researcher 
um, who did one, you know, you would basically give access to your camera and then they would run you through a series of sort of common motion recognition systems and you know, give you some sort of insight into the things that, you know, happy inferences that companies could be potentially making about you. I, I think something like that in VR actually would, would be an amazing way to demonstrate to people and to really hit home immediately with, uh, to show them the types of uh, tracking and, you know, inferences potentially subjected to. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to react. Uh, please raise your hand or make a noise because here. Ah, okay. I'll give you a, a quick one if you have a second. Um, I, I think that there are some really positive uses to all of these invasive technologies that we're talking about. We wouldn't be developing them if there weren't positive uses, right? Uh, if they're all negative, let's just ban them. But but uh, as an example of the sort of emotional detection stuff, one of the uses that I really would love to see is something that can give us uh, feedback about our own emotions in real time. So you know, we've all had that experience of starting to get upset when somebody's saying something that's triggering us. And sometimes we lose our ability to respond the way we'd want to respond. So imagine you had a pair of glasses that could have a little red light that starts to come on to remind you, nobody else, just you, when you're in that state. And I, I would love to raise a, a general emotional awareness of everybody to see that you know we can all be triggered and, and to notify us when it happens, but also I think to start promising that we're not gonna share that data with anybody else. Because I think one of the requirements for having a device like I just described would be, I would never use a device like that if I thought that somebody could mine that data. Once I knew about it, especially, I would be very concerned about it. So I'm very much in favor of educating people more on the possibilities uh, and what can, this can do. But the one counterpoint I'll add real quick before I stop is I've come to the conclusion recently, I didn't start this way, but recently that some of these things are so complicated and so nuanced that it may not be possible to get consent. That, that, that anything we try, even to, to educate people and teach them what these things, what, what things are happening, we may need to come in and say, look, these are just not possible to consent. So let's just figure out a way to, to actually regulate and legislate um, for the best broadest good. And I don't think that should be used too broadly, but there are gonna be examples where, where we already know that it's the case that, that some people will just say either they don't care or they just don't understand potentially how impacting this can be. That's a really, okay, please. Okay, who is speaking? Who is speaking? Jessica, since we are talking about users control, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work you have been doing on users control. Maybe you just published a research about um, that was funded by Facebook Reality Lab, uh, well, Meta, and where you interview around, I think it was 1,000 people in the US on their act attitudes towards privacy and data collection, and you learn certain information. Maybe you can share that with us? Yeah, I would be happy to. Can you all hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, I think the, the, just picking up on what Avi is saying around consent and consent models, um, there's some findings that I have inside of that research around how the existing models to notify and consent, people, people report those feeling like privacy violations. So in, in the survey, there's a lot of findings as it relates to people's level of distress with what's going on with web and mobile. And then I also asked them about hypothetical situations, including like biometric photography and facial recognition tracking. And yeah, like there's a really substantial um, portion of respondents who were not comfortable with their data being used in these secondary ways, wh whether it was being sold whether there were predictions being made about them. And even a third of people were like really adamant they didn't want their data be used to be used for, you know, um, suggesting like customizing products to them, which is one of those one of the nine uses of it. So I think there's a really high level of discomfort. 28% of people said there's at least one product they won't use due to um, a privacy or security concern. 37% of people reported that they've updated their privacy settings on some device. 
within the past three months, which I think indicates that people are paying attention. And just overall, there's a really high adoption of industry privacy solutions. So when I asked if people, to what extent people were using, um, you know, either free or paid for services, 87% of people said they were using one and 50% of people said they were paying for one. So that to me indicates that people are really trying to pay attention. It's something, privacy is something that they value. And I think that um, for XR to really grow and um, uh, and like get the type of user adoption for these amazing use cases that exist, I think that people are gonna need to have some assurances in order to um, in order to make sure that, oh, Katiki, I'm seeing your message about how I'm supposed to amplify myself. How do I do that? <laughs> Marco, can you can you amplify? Uh, well, I'll just I'll just close out by saying that um, the survey showed there's a really high level of distress or uh, even around consent models, even around default settings. And I think there's a massive opportunity to really like reimagine how how these new models could come in um, where people could actually feel more empowered around this. I don't know if that's gonna be around tech, like their understanding of technological solutions like differential privacy or um, or just changing what, um, what type what types of models we use to gain consent. If, if I could briefly add to that, and I, I love how you put that. Again, this is where things like homomorphic encryption short circuits it. Data never needs to be understood by- Could you inc increase your volume, please? Increase my volume? Okay, I believe I'm at max. And Stand close to the stage. To be able to speak. Clearly, uh, oh, Laudi, thank you. How do I increase my volume? Yeah, that's better. I think, yeah. This is where I'm a bit confused as to why homomorphic encryption is not a topic we brought up. I demonstrated a working demo on a magic leap about five years ago that made sure that the data is never decrypted, it's never understood by the system. We're able to evaluate it, we're able to perform operations on it. There isn't even a need for consent. In fact, we created privacy groups where individuals would have a gesture or whatever means they would want to be able to provide to be able to offer this consent. So I think this whole concept of what do we need to give up to the corporation is, is embedding itself in a knowledge set that relies on old encryption, a classic encryption. The point of homomorphic encryption, if we would mandate this through all XR operating systems and devices, is that wherever it can be applied, the data is never decrypted. You don't need to be concerned with consent. In fact, you get control over whomever it is that gets consent. So I think that if, if we're still having a conversation about like what RSA and elliptic curve encryption, et cetera, are doing, we're having this discussion about what, what does a given company need to know about this, when right now today, we don't need to know anything to give you the same customized Oculus Home to the same customized home page. That, that, that hasn't needed to happen for years. It feels as if they understand that they either don't want to implement it for expense or they understand what it would actually do to their business model and there's incentive not to get involved that way. Well, th thanks, Dylan, and I, I appreciate your, your comments about homomorphic uh, encryption. But I think you know there, there's a lot of other challenges here, and one of them is you know we're calling upon uh, you know with a statement today on governments and companies to take better practice, encryption being being part of that. But uh, I think there's a lot of work to do to get companies and developers to incorporate encryption strongly uh, in their projects, even just any kind of end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, and I, I appreciate the efforts of differential privacy and homomorphic encryption to try solve for some of these uh, these problems. Uh, but I think there's a lot of work to do uh, to uh, the suggest the, of a rule that everyone has to do it. Uh, that, that, that's uh, a lot of work that has to be done to get that rule out there. Um, next, go, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, I think Warren Schlesig's approach of saying that there's different layers of which that you're uh, addressing these different issues, starting with like, 
a well the earth and then the cultural context and then from there you have the legal context and the economic context and then eventually you get to the technological architecture and the code and these ethical issues cannot be solved through pure de technological determinism meaning that you can just find a technological fix to, to sort of solve everything you have to have different layers of both the law and other aspects of um, the um, oh, I'm getting a Please look me the phone, okay. Um, I don't, um, I'm not having a microphone that's showing up. So, um, so anyway, the, because the, um, sorry, I got distracted. The, uh, so there's not, there's, there's the, the big thing that I'd say is context and what the, the contextual use of information in Nissenbaum's contextual integrity which I was appreciating what uh, uh, Vera was saying earlier. Oops, how about that? Uh, confirm, can you hear me now? We got you. Yes. Okay, um, I don't know where I got cut off, uh, so I'll just go back to the um, part where the, you can't technologically uh, have the, Technological determinism, meaning that you have just a pure technological solution to some of these issues. There's always going to be contextual dimensions, and there's always going to be other realms in which that you may need to have law. I think the the big thing in uh, Nissenbaum's contextual integrity is trying to find what appropriate flow is. And because these are new contextual domains, there's no existing normative standards for what is expected for what is required and what isn't required. Um, but also the don't the norms around um, all the psychographic profiling, you know, the work from Britton Heller and biometric psychography. I'd also point to Raphael Yusta and the Morningstar Group's um, overarching human rights approach to neurodata called the NeuroRights Initiative. So they have five fundamental neuro rights. I think three are really crucial, but I'll say all five briefly. One is the right to identity, uh, which means that you are trying to preserve the autonomy that you have control over who is recording all this information and trying to profile you and model your identity. And then uh, from there, the right to mental privacy, meaning that there's gonna be things in which that this technology is gonna be able to read our thoughts and our emotions and create a fusion of all this information. And so we have a right to you know, maintain our autonomy over our mental privacy. Um, and then the right to, uh, to uh, agency is after they've modeled us to the point where they start to try to nudge our behaviors, then we have the right to prevent living in a world where we're constantly trying to be nudged and undermining our, our rights to agency. And then the other two are the right to um, fair and equal access to technology and also to be free from algorithmic bias, which I think are general ethical issues and not so much, they're, they're certainly relevant to the neurodata, but I think the uh, identity agency and mental privacy are the ones that I am you know, the most concerned of in terms of the implications of the um, XR technologies. And I think that's the, where we need a lot of either intervention from establishing these as a human right, these neuro rights as a human right. Um, and then from there, whether or not those human rights are then fed into our, our laws, you know, especially regional laws, are gonna be binding for a lot of these companies to perhaps put some you know, constraints in terms of the degree to which that they can undermine our rights to identity, rights to uh, agency and rights to mental privacy. So in terms of uh, human rights approaches to uh, privacy, those are things that are on my radar. Um, there's a lot of open questions for how that actually plays out, but I just wanted to kind of throw out some of those ideas in that there's a, a group of neuroscientists that are out there creating a generalized framework for how to translate these neuro rights into different governance frameworks. Um, that was released in September. Um, and at my talk that I gave at AWE, I gave a little bit of a um, overview of that. And I previously gave a whole talk on sort of the state of privacy, uh, and I'll, I'll send those out uh, as a tweet to kind of link to those two talks I gave if you want more information on any of that. Sure. I think this really got us exactly into the stage of the discussion that we wanted to get to now, which was the solutions and pathways. And I think from Dylan and Kent, we just heard a pretty great overview of, you know, two absolutely necessary components of that. One is a technical component and we heard some really interesting stuff on how we could use homomorphic encryption um, and then from Kent also on you know the regulatory approach and also some of these emerging discussions around possibility of new human rights um, we'll 
say that, yeah, so I, I definitely agree that the um, way to be free from algorithmic bias is probably not the best framed one, given that the whole discussion around AI ethics and bias has been quite critical of the bias framing, um, you know, as not really capturing the essence of how algorithms AI can actually oppress people. Um, but even on mental privacy, I, I think, I don't know if anyone like some of the uh, Katitsa or Gaspar or someone wants to, to jump in, because I, I think from the you know, perspective of people who are working on with, you know, existing data protection legislation, privacy legislation, seems m maybe we could adapt the existing rights that we have you know, the right to privacy um, and use data protection regulation to actually achieve the things that we want from this right to mental privacy, um, which in itself could be great, maybe if it already existed, but, you know, and Kent, you had a great um, uh, put on this in one of your podcasts about the extremely complex process that we would have to go through to get it, you know, accepted as a right to get it uh, into something workable. So I. I'm just wondering if anyone has thoughts on you know, what's been brought up so far, how existing existing regulations could work. Um, yeah, I think I would like to um, maybe ask a question that create a little of like tension here. <laughs> um, some developers are really passionate with the idea of being able to have some freedom to experiment. Uh, um, some without harming the people, but play with emotional reactions or be able to do certain things on XR. And sometimes that will require some of your data, your mental data. Um, and some others, we are concerned about the use of this data, of our, the data that will reveal our emotional vulnerabilities that later can be used to target us with certain type of advertisement. Um, where, how we do draw the line in, in, uh, and I, uh, I want to hear from people like Andrea, who have been thinking a lot, she's a, a developer and a designer. Um, I think, uh, Andrea, are you here? I think I'm having a similar problem like Kent. I'm not seeing the amplify megaphone. I think that only I the hosts have, have the ability to self amplify, so one of the hosts has to amplify the speaker. All right, then, then someone could do that for me. Um, From XRS, uh, Christina, maybe you can help us. Um, Christina doesn't. I can hear you, Andrea. All right, great. So I'm just going to go ahead. Um, I think there are two sides to the discussion of data. Um, so on one hand, there's what we've been discussing, which is this new technology is definitely allowing us to, to know deeper things about ourselves. And then if we could talk about the algorithms and how we interpret that data and just measure it. Um, but that, that has a big assumption. That assumes that we are who do not change and we are the same kind of people doing the same kind of things as in physical reality. And in the metaverse, in every world that we're in, we are the same kind of entity. Um, I want to read to you the title of an article that came out um, a few days ago, December 3rd, in the Jour Journal of Neuroscience. Here's the title. Journal of Ownership of Our Entire Spine brings about fast changes of frontal parietal cortical dynamics. So I'm not going to go into like exactly what that means, but basically starting to gather a different kind of data, um, data about how our brains change when we are in this environment. So our visual cortex is communicating with the motor cortex in a very, very different way. Um, so, this is not how algorithms are going to interpret things. This is about scientists trying to figure out how the way we function at a very deep 
cognitive level is different in VR. Um, and then going back to what Katica was saying, there are developers like myself that are very interested in pushing those boundaries and exploring that. So I don't have an interest in creating VR experience where we are embodying like homomorphic things like here. I want to make, I want to help people transform into other things. That transformation we know now, like in this article that just came out a few years ago, a few days ago, implies transformations at the neural level. Um, and I think that needs to be discussed more. We need to start by acknowledging that we don't have we don't we don't have any idea what that means. We've never had a kind of technology that would do this to us in our living rooms. So how do we even tackle that? Um, and so, so this is a completely different mm -hmm. chapter than, than, than using algorithms to interpret the data. This is finding out how this is transforming us into different kind of humans. Um, and and what, that does, what does that mean? Um, so we said how we, we were talking earlier about how it's difficult to communicate to people how this data might be used against them or, or to their advantage. Um, well, imagine how hard it is to communicate to people the fact that their brains are changing, they're using VR, um, and we don't even know how that could be used in either good or bad ways right now. Um, but I, I do think there's a need for discussion, and, and developers like myself, of course, need help figuring out well, how far do we go, um, how do we communicate to people these things. So, and, and it's also about, okay, I'm offering people these possibilities to transform themselves and I'm trying to explain the best I can what that means so they can make a good decision do I want to experience this or not um, but there's 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 an extent to which I don't fully understand what what's going on with them um, so I'm not able to to fully accompanying accompany them in that process um, Katica and I were talking um, earlier also about the need to teach people. So, so, so we are dealing with the need to educate people at a level that we've never faced before. So there's one, educate people about literacy, about privacy, and the danger of sharing your data. Great. How do we talk to people about literacy that their brains are transforming, are being transformed by this technology? Um, and, and that things that they might enjoy, like flying in VR or being a space octopus or God knows what else we're going to come up with, um, has, has this level of impact. Maybe you can explain a little bit about flying on VR, why, why, why you wrote that example. Um, uh, I think that uh, you, you were giving me some examples in our call. And maybe you can share a little bit about that the risk of flying yeah. or why it's awesome to fly. I want to fly too. So, so data, just like the article that I, I quoted from a few days ago, there's very fresh data coming in, uh, proving that whenever we are doing things that drastically depart from what we would do in physical reality and in our humanoid bodies that have a certain mode of locomotion, there's data coming in that says there's this big changes happening in the brain when we do like completely, let's say, call them crazy things. So when we have the feeling that, oh, this is, it's exactly the thing that make VR amazing. You have the feeling, oh, I can fly in VR. That just feels so new and so wonderful. Well, that observation, it feels so new. That implies a change at the neural level. Um, and, and, and we're starting to get data on that kind of change. Um, so we need to start to, to, we need to stop taking these things for granted um, and say, okay, we're going to get mesmerized by these amazing new powers we have in VR, but that comes with, I don't want to call it a cost, but, but that implies very serious, serious things. So it's not just about let's deal with, with, with privacy and then we can play in here uh, and do whatever we want. That playing in here and that freedom has even further implications that we are not, we haven't even started to deal with. 
think that I mean, what is you're Christina saying, here? Yeah. Or yeah. anyone yes, wants hi, to Kalita. react to? Yeah, yeah I think I'm that that's sorry, such a great point. Oh, sorry. I, you know, I couldn't agree more with, with your statement. And I think that absolutely we need to be able to define those boundaries and really help, I think, developers and designers as well as corporations understand like the ecosystem that we're creating, right? And how do we actually treat the data or the signals and how do we signify to people the changes that are about to happen so they're prepared for the technologies, right? I mean, it's about choices at the end of the day but people can't make that choice unless they're educated. And unfortunately, you're right. This is a brand new type of technology. It's a very new way of experiencing things that are fundamentally changing, um, not just our brains, but our norms and our experiences, right? I'm thinking about the example you just gave in terms of you know, flying. I'm also wondering, you know, what would happen if somebody tried to right now, oh, my avatar, right? Like, I mean, you know, you're not killing me per se. So is it okay to actually, you know, kill my avatar? Like, is that acceptable? Is that ethical? Is that what we want to encourage? Where do we draw the lines between understanding, you know, what's the reality of that? Um, especially with younger children who don't necessarily have the real um, analog experience to apply to immersive technologies. Some of the data points that as adults we might or we might still be able to trigger. So I think that you know there is this new reality that we're living in and there's layers to it and it's complex, which is why the only thing that we know how to do or that we've been talking about doing at XRSI is let's take it down to the data level and to the um, contextual level and let's start to understand how does this translate into the use and the application and the limitations that we need to put in place so that we are safe. Because nobody's saying, don't go ahead and leverage immersive technology. In fact, it can be brilliant, right? If you can detect, for example, that um, I'm about to have a heart attack and you can alert somebody who maybe hasn't ever flown before, but they have experience in, you know, in sort of the immersive reality that they can actually fly, then flying might be appropriate. It might be okay because they could get me to a hospital and save my life potentially, right? But Again, you know, if, if we're changing the brains and the neurological makeup of individuals and they actually think that they can fly, then we're not really doing them a service, nor are we respecting citizens and, you know, really their safety at the end of the day. So, you know, I, everything that you said, I guess I'm agreeing to. I think it is fascinating to me uh, just to observe that, again, you know, we've been making these choices or rather not making deliberate choices in the regular web world for 30 years now. And here we are with this daunting task. What we need to do is start to exercise those governance muscles a little bit more, um, a little bit better, so that we can actually get this one right next time go. Uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I wanna add something really quickly. Um, I do think that in this context, our existing concepts of privacy and safety short. So if I read this title again, um, is it safe if our brain has changes of frontal parietal cortical dynamics? Well, gee, I don't know. I mean, does anyone know what this? Probably not. So, what is safety in this context? And 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 yeah, the other thing is like at this level, this is influencing not just the way we move. Um, it's influencing the way we think. It's influencing behaviors. Like we don't even know how to. Find what is safe in this context. So I think first we need to maybe take a step back and admit that, and admit that mm -hmm. we need to need to redefine these, these words. I think we have, quote unquote, it, it it's a bit easier, quote unquote, to deal with issues of data and privacy because it feels like we could take those from the internet and from from the bad things we've gone through with social media. And they can kind of apply them in this context and they kind of work. Um, but, but in this other territory, we're really kind of lost. Well, and let's, let's separate that. Completely agree. And when I say data, I'm not talking data and privacy. I'm taking from, I'm talking about fundamental data classification, right? So if you have a piece of data about me, I think we can argue, or we can probably agree um, around that data set, right? And that's what we're really trying to do. In fact, when we had our roundtables this morning um, and working sessions around data, 
um, it was really with the intent to start classifying data, right? We actually have to understand and define data. What are the components? What are the actual bits and pieces that we're actually looking at, either defining or collecting or, or analyzing or having? And I think if we can fundamentally start to build out a schema classification, right, then we can start to layer on top of that the complexities. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dylan, oh, oh, Andrea, someone want to reply? Please jump, Andrea. Yeah, I, I think that sounds wonderful. And, and part of the, the job that you so guys are look at doing, grouping that's, or facets. Yeah, so that's no, I mean, and we would love your input. Like, I'm like, you know, it would be great if, you know, we had more thinking around that because I think it, you're right. We have to take it and net it out. Right, and only then can we start talking things like safety or privacy or equality or accessibility or you know all of these really grand terms that sound wonderful. But at the end of the day, what do they mean in this new context? And I don't think that any of us are saying we know because I think the reality is we don't know, but we can come to know if we work at defining that. And it has to start somewhere. And I think classification is a reasonable approach. Okay, thank you. Ivan, would you like to reply or someone wants to jump into this conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one okay. thing. I mean, yeah. what, what really fascinated me about that, uh, the topic that was just going back and forth about what the new experiences will do to our brains, it makes me have the following thought. So I came in here wondering about things like targeted ads, but now I'm wondering about something else that might require a different type of classification. So on the regular web, there's a lot of focus on dark patterns. I'm wondering here if in an immersive environment, the issue won't simply be um, targeting ads, but priming somebody to be vulnerable so that when the ad comes, they will already be in a certain state of mind. In other words, hearing what I just heard about the potential unknown implications of something like flying, I could imagine how a range of experiences that we don't have IRL, being weightless, doing a whole variety of things, could be in a very manipulative and calculated way, sort of set us up to be vulnerable so that the issue isn't simply presenting the pathway that leads us towards that particular form of information being presented. Absolutely, yeah, I would absolutely. say it. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I was so, like, yeah. thanks for thinking oh. the same. But I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. And extend that out to things like, you know, chill, child predators, right? And some of the preconceived notions we have around what they might look like um, and what how they might, um, you know, present themselves. And then think about, you know, children in that context, right? You know, they can actually be um, taught, and we've seen this already, you know, from, from studies, that children can be taught to actually reverse the things that they've learned at home with their families simply by being groomed over time um, and sort of through the, the distorted reality concept. And so there's tons of harms and it's not just in the child predators. It's also, you know, a lot of new areas that we haven't been talking about. It's like, well, what does pornography mean? You know, what if it's not a real human? You know, what is it, you know, does that differ in terms of the morality? Um, you know, it, it's so there's just so many different and new areas. And I think, you know, targeted advertising is one thing. We're already at the point of, you know, nano targeting where Facebook can find us, you know, within 98% um, accuracy without having primary data points. Um, you know, take that on steroids and this is where we're at. Um, but I would go back to the fact that certain things we don't understand and we have to have a starting point for discussion. And I think the only way that we can overlay those values, I'm not gonna say ethics, I'm gonna use the word values deliberately, but the only way that we can overlay values um, and decide, you know, is it appropriate for regulation? Is it appropriate for, you know, digital policies at the corporate level? Um, do we need to actually educate, train developers and designers? All of that comes well after we've defined what the playing field looks like. We've actually defined some common ways of talking about these things so that we can okay, understand uh, the fundamental scheme and overlay with those we values. Have seven minutes before finishing, so I want to start wrapping up. I think it's, I think I do love the freedom to experiment that Andrea say, but I think that we have learned so far that just not doing anything doesn't work, and we don't want to uh, uh, to live in a world 
like social media, when people start experimenting without our consent, without our understanding of the issue, without really thinking on the human being, on the our data that you are experimented with. So on one hand, I do want to fly because fly is awesome. <laughs> I really want to do that, but I don't want you to start wait, wait for you to have policies because to privacy or have ethical guidelines just later in the game. I need to start discussing it now. I need to start educating regulators right now because right now I'm still struggling to explain a regulator what is an IP address or a judge what is an IP addresses. Imagine has to explain it. What is the meta, the, all the technology behind the metaverse? So we cannot wait. And I think things have to go hand in hand because what we have learned from the past is that the past didn't work well. Um, and so we need to think on the future. We have five minutes before finishing and I want to give everyone like one tweet message before leaving and then we can wrap up for, for some talkings and some social interaction between ourselves and get to know each other. So please, uh, I will start asking Brita, maybe a tweet message um, of reflection about uh, what people should be thinking on these issues. Yes. I, uh, most in, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I, I think the, the most intriguing um, thing that I, there, there's two things that stood out to me in this discussion that I think are very intriguing. One is um, sort of the concept of snake oil. So we, we seem to start saying that, well, we shouldn't overemphasize what this technology can do, but then we kind of curved around to the consensus of, we don't know what it can do yet. So in a situation like that, I think um, where, where we are in an information void, it's going to be very, um, very challenging to create new ethical standards and to have those correspond with legal standards. Um, Evan wrote something, I think it was like three weeks ago, that I, I found to be extraordinarily profound. Um, it was an op-ed that, that he published in, um, in the Boston Globe, where basically he says, facial recognition software, you know, may not work, but sometimes it doesn't matter if it works because if people in authority think it does, the damage is already done. So my, um, what this brings up for me is that um, we, if we don't know the full impact of these technologies, maybe what we should focus on um, instead is not just a list of horribles, but trying to think more about what we want this to do and to focus at as much attention on that as we do on identifying terms to really build the virtual world and the mechanisms to support that that we want to see. Um, Jessica, do you want to give a concluding message very quickly and we have to go to the next? Yeah. Lessig model that, that Kent brought up about how these, this, any solutions, they need to be seen through multiple lenses. It can't just be a technological lens. It can't only be an economic lens or a market fundamentalism lens. Like I think that there's a big opportunity to think through what are the cultural values um, and what, what is this new, what are these new ways of building culture that we want to participate in because I mean, my fundamental concern is that if we build new systems using old assumptions, that we may just end up replicating the harms of the existing systems. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Rafaela, I know you don't work in XR and this is your first experience in the uh, XR world and uh, analysis space, um, but you work on human rights for many years. Do you have any comment you would like to share? I don't want to put you on the spot, but what you can bring that yeah, idea to us very sort of direct conference to them as part of the meditation i think that the considerations you share the comments you share um bring a lot of things to think about how human rights assessment should be carried out thinking about uh this kind of environment 
I'm especially concerned about Shirin Yaakov, surveillance, and privacy, and how this can affect freedom of expression. And also, in terms of diversity, I think that uh, there's a lot to think about how we can, how freedom of expression will be not accessible for specific bodies or individual artists. So I think that there's a lot to think about. Thank you so much for this evening, for this space. Thank you. Very, you have a, a short message. Uh, I also, you, I know you don't work on XR issues, but um, do you have any concluding message for me, for us? Yeah, I guess that my concluding message would be um, the, the relevance of this discussion and the, the relevance of having in mind a human rights framework, including privacy and in data protection in that and, and, and how to deal with these new challenges and new threats and also opportunities and also good things that may come up with uh, experimenting with technology. And in, in this sense also building on the discussion of new rights, for example, um, I think that human rights and data protection frameworks already deals with many of these concerns and perhaps we should look at them um, and 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 take the opportunity of their uh, their uh, guarantees before perhaps creating new frameworks. So this is a discussion that we have in Chile right now, and this is something that perhaps we will see in other places as well. Thank you. Uh, ro uh, we have uh, Avi and maybe uh, uh, Sean can give uh, some words. And then I will pass the mic to Rory, who will explain the community lab. Oh, wow. Uh, um, I'll, you know what, I'll pass. I don't have anything short to say, so I'll let someone else here. Okay, uh, sure. One quick thing for, I'll jump in just to say that uh, uh, responsible innovation frameworks is another big thing that uh, I came across in terms of the overarching trend and i think that um, trying to match up ethical frameworks with existing responsible innovation um, frameworks is something that um, i was talking about at awd and something that we should look into and uh something that i it's a topic that uh, if you have something that you'd like to come on the podcast and talk about uh, some of these different issues or the voice uh, of the ethical issues then that's a topic on the voices of vr that i've been tracking and i'd love to contact with uh, more folks here and continue the conversation with the larger community. Okay. Anyone final concluding remarks? And then I think we have for one more person and then we have to go next. Someone who had not to speak. Nobody jumping? Okay, so Roy, maybe you can explain the community lab, which will be more interactive than our panel. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for this great panel. Uh, we're going to kick it to an intermission for the next 12 minutes or so. Uh, and then I uh, will return on the hour um, to have our community lab about decentralization in the metaverse. Um, so basically, these issues of user control over their own devices and not getting trapped in a walled garden infrastructure um, and ensuring these platforms are, cannot be leveraged by single actors or uh, people can evade uh, state or private censorship. Uh, that's the general topic, but a World Cafe style uh, community lab, which essentially means everyone will break off and do smaller conversations um, with some you. guiding questions, and then be uh, we'll reconvene at the very end to share what we discover in that. So if that sounds interesting to you, please uh, return on the hour and feel free to take a break to uh, get a drink, recharge your mind and or devices. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, before finishing, I think I would like to see if Gaspar has a concluding remarks. Uh, Gaspar? Is he there? Uh -oh. was mentioned by Beliana. Um, 
sorry, I'm trying to make my voice a little bit louder. Um, we already have initiatives on, on this issue. I think experience in, in Chile is being quite eye-opening. Um, there's already regulators working on this. And I think it's really important to have these discussions, but also try to get into a more, uh, let's say, pragmatic, pragmatic policy making uh, work. Uh, we need to to kind of deploy this this knowledge that we are already building. And I think most of our wor worries come from our current experience, right? So um, it was mentioned that this is very similar to what happened when internet started, and and we had this idealistic. Uh, idea of what internet meant, uh, and when they realized that there are way too many risks and this ideal fall apart. Um, I think this is quite similar, this, this experience, and uh, we need to get started and learn from this experience in order to try to get it right this time, let's say. Um, and I think what's very important is that we do it all together. Um, we, try, we need to work more as a community involving other actors and not staying alone as academics, scientists, developers, uh, policy people. And we really need to be more um, collaborative in order to, to get it right, I think. All right, thank you. I think we're taking a quick break.